Hello, everyone. Welcome to Paris Gibson Square Museum of Arts FaceTime Live discussion with artist Jennifer Combe. My name is Nicole Evans. I'm the curator of collections and exhibitions at the museum. And I am pleased to be here with Jennifer Combe, who will be discussing with us her exhibition, Distilled, now on view through September in our Wilder Gallery in our museum here in Great Falls, Montana. Um, thank you, Jennifer, for being here with us tonight on this summer night. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so what we're going to go through today is we're going to we're going to talk about we're going to talk with Jennifer. We're going to have a casual discussion. We're going to look a little deeply as well into her process as an artist. We're going to look at the work that she has on exhibit as well as look back in time um, at her work over the last few years and create connections between these pieces and her ideas. Um, if many of many of you might know or do not know that Jennifer Combe is associate professor of art at um, the University in Missoula. And she is um, presenting this work as well in relation to your sabbatical, correct, Jennifer? Mm -hmm. And um, it's an important event and an important body of work um, that relates to her work as a, an artist and educator and professor. So we are very lucky to have her use up one of her lovely summer days <laughs> to um, discuss her work with us. We're gonna have a little PowerPoint presentation here just so that there's a better understanding of what the work is to have the visuals. Um, I've had a lot of people say that these Zoom discussions actually help them see the work. Um, unless you come to the gallery, it's very difficult to see what the work looks like. So I suggest you do that. <laughs> But I'm going to go ahead and open up our PowerPoint here so that you can see and we can begin our discussion. Once again, thank you, Jennifer Combe. Here we see the title of her exhibition, Distilled, and a few of her pieces. We are so glad to have all of you here. Thank you as well to all of our sponsors, those who help make our exhibitions, programs, and educational opportunities happen at our museum. Thank you for all that you do for um, the Great Falls community through Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art. All of us at the square um, give you much gratitude. Once again, welcome to our discussion. I'm gonna begin by showing you this um, slide with four images of Jennifer Combs' exhibition distilled um, at the museum. In, uh, in this presentation, she'll be diving into a little bit about a few works, about, uh, about four works, Jennifer, um, in, your, in the exhibition. But what you can see is kind of how the work looks in our gallery today, as you can see, they are very interesting, complex works of art that deal as much with color and form as they do with um, meaning and content. I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to you. Jennifer, would you like to look at ground or do you want me to stay right here? We can start with ground. That would be, okay. be great. But okay. I really want to start by thanking you, Nicole, for spending so much time installing the work with me and talking together about the work and about parenting and about making space in our communities and culture through art. So it's been a real treat to work with you and with everyone at the square. And if you haven't been there, it's a fantastic space and it's an old school, which uh, really uh, fits with my work and also with uh, like I think the purpose of an, an art museum. So it's a great space. Thank you. So much, Jennifer. We're really looking forward to your discussion. Thanks. So this work I made uh, in grad school about halfway through in 2007. And I, you know, previously had been working only, well, not only for, I don't know, 
let's see, for 10 years or so, maybe 20, I don't know how many years, uh, with oil and working from life. So working with a model, working uh, with a still life, and then also actually making abstractions on my own. And, you know, you go to grad school and everything that you know comes unraveled and you try to figure out what to do next and you think too much and you don't work and then you make some work because you have a deadline. And I, I brought this work, which is, um, it's canvas and linen um, and hemp all um, PVA or glued to a panel. And then I placed all the pieces together and covered, covered the surface with marble dust, which is a like a bumpy, chalky kind of textured ground that grabs the paint. And then I put a wash of white on it, of uh, chalk and uh, powdered, powdered paint essentially. And so in painting, that's called a ground. And, and I was so satisfied just without painting it at all, I left it and I started working primarily just with these uh, kind of raw materials that an oil painter in the Western tradition works with and is trained to work with. Um, and I took it to my critique and I was terrified. And then the professor started to say, oh, I think that, you know, you're starting to break, about, break apart, break down uh, European painting. So this is a really good step. And I felt like I'd pulled the wool over her eyes because I didn't think that that was what I was doing at all. I was working with form and I'm um, like cleansing, creating space in the chaos of the process of um, being in school. But I thought this, this work um, really fit with this exhibition because of the simplicity of the geometry and of the order. And that's something that um, is within me for my upbringing from the way my brain works as I try to make sense of the world around me. And these forms have appeared again and again and again and when I, I, I think I didn't, I wasn't planning on talking about this, but when I was an undergrad, <laughs> I worked with um, these amazing faculty members at the Evergreen State College, Marilyn Frasca and Duran Crable. And they, they, um, Duran has um, since passed away. She's missed dearly. But they really worked with the imagery that we brought to the table ourselves. And in their courses, I was never given an assignment. I just had to create work from my own work. And I remember Marilyn just sitting there saying, you know what to paint. Look at your past painting. That is the guidepost that will lead you forward. And, and I went through a period where I, you know, pushed that away. It was like, oh, this is too woo-woo. You know, I, and it's a period too, I think of pushing through like, um, um, uh, I can't remember the word that I want to use for this, but like pushing away feminism and, you know, not really internalized misogyny, internalized patriarchy. So pushing away like the female voice, the female intuition, um, because it didn't fit this like role model of the man as genius. Um, but I really, haven't been able to free myself of until midlife, um, even in these pretty radical um, institutions. So I think going back and reclaiming um, what I found and what I learned about myself through those early teachings and moving forward with, the, um, with abstraction, with these forms that um, to me are full, that are nest-like, that are ordered, that create order out of the chaos of the human experience of my human experience in 2021. Um, and yeah. I think that's a very important point that you just say my human experience, but you're creating these abstracted forms. And a little bit like before we talk to everybody here, we talk about what we're going to talk about, right, <laughs> Jennifer. And we were using we and she came to a point where she was talking about how her work is autobiographical. And mm -hmm. Jennifer, you were just talking about how this um, this work of art ground was uh, very foundational in your work mm -hmm. and how it's moved forward, yet it's very abstract in nature. Can you share a little bit with the audience? Um, how do you make a connection 
between autobiographical work and work that you create that is often, that is abstract and sometimes in, in other work that you have created conceptual? Well, I, I have a strong desire to have a sense of order and the, the imagery, the geometric uh, shapes and forms that I essentially organize, um, I think it suggests a type of um, freeness, but also tightness of wanting to organize a certain situation or thought or environment um, uh, in order to soothe, in order to um, simplify, in order to understand. So that's one aspect of um, abstraction being autobiographical. But I also think that these um, kind of swollen uh, half circles, semicircles, for me, they can suggest a nest or a swollen belly or a breast um, or even a nipple. And so for me, throughout time, it's this idea of, you know, this long time struggle of, you know, will I, do I really want to have kids? How will that impact my career um, as an artist, even as a, a human? What does it mean to be um, a cisgender female to raise children in this world? How will that impact um, my path forward? Um, so, I mean, it's always been an interest of mine, but it's something that I've also pushed away and then invited back in. So these forms that have um, kind of followed me throughout life just appear again and again and again. And I don't, I don't intentionally, you know, ask them to, they just do. Um, I think we can, I'm going to pop, well, we'll go to this one then, I think. So um, since you were just talking about that autobiographical nature of your abstract work, and your experience as a woman and mother, like you were just saying. We're gonna look a little bit forward from that 2007 date where that was your graduate work. And mm -hmm. you were talking about that groundwork, literally, right? Mm -hmm. And little did you know, right? Doo -doo -doo, little did you know that that piece of work would be so founda foundational um, in, the duration of your work across time, but you kept it because you, why did you keep it? Did you find that to be something that was a platform for you that you just found very important? You know, some people do their graduate work, they keep it and others somehow it doesn't stay with them. So mm -hmm. can you speak to that a little bit? Um. Well, my first answer is that, well, it didn't sell, but I don't think that's really, I don't think that's really it. I, yeah, I've just hung on to it and I, I, I didn't intentionally think, oh, I'm going to keep this. I just did. Um, so I think somewhere in the back of my mind, I knew that it, it meant something. And honestly, until this exhibition, I mean, it's just been, it was hanging in our house for a while, a couple of years. And then we moved it down to, or I moved it down to the basement and wrapped it up and I, and as I was working, actually, as I was making the works for the show, I remembered it and I got it out. And then when we had the discussion in the gallery of um, how those shapes were repeating, you know, more than a decade later, I was kind of shocked. And it took me back to thinking about working with Marilyn and, and Duran years ago. So, um, so tell me about that now that we're looking at groundwork and you are you and you somehow in one way or another it became very important to you in the duration of your work with that autobiographical element to your abstract work and how you are moving from but we're moving seven years here so mm -hmm. 2007 to 2014 in visceral mm -hmm. so tell me tell us a little bit about visceral and the shapes that we're seeing here okay so like i had I had my first child in 2014 and I was completely overwhelmed with like the carnal elements of it, like the, the, the body, the breastfeeding, the constant um, 
fear of something happening to this child and the constant weight of having this child on my, on my person, you know, at 40, having been this completely independent um, person for 40 years. And I was also terrified of that I would kill her or make a mistake and, you know, hurt her in some way. And I think that um, I was also, I was, I'm trying to, yeah, I had, I'd also, I mean, I transitioned from teaching to high school to teaching at the college level. And I, and I really was at a stagnant point in my painting and nothing, you know, was going well. It was almost like pure non-objective work wasn't working. Like I had to, I had to say more because I was so raw and emotional. So I started thinking of, and um, I like to hunt as well. And so I was thinking about this, these, like the period of approaching an animal right after, um, it's been shot and that kind of intensity and how the intensity of having a newborn is, is similar. It's so fragile and life is so fragile. So I, um, I just introduced this, this deer, a fawn in a couple of the, in four of the, the works. And then I wanted to, I didn't, you know, I didn't want to paint like a fawn in the woods. I didn't want a, a narrative work. But I thought, you know, I just started working with these semicircles, these half circles, and then they seemed like breasts or like penises or like a swollen pregnant belly. So it just kind of, to me, um, mentions like the, or suggests the, the, the visceral experience of, of childbirth and newborns and death and birth and afterbirth. So, um, Tell us a little bit now that you've discussed how you how you immersed yourself in 2014 based on um, your uh, the birth of your child. Um, in 27 in 2007, there was no thought of this, right? Were you ever thinking about the possibility or, of having children at that time and how those abstract forms would might some way? Oh, yes. No, 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 no. <laughs> I was thinking, how much can I like grow as a painter before it's too late to have babies? Yeah. So it's interesting the that relationship between how your work grew from that into a very personal autobiographical work mm -hmm. right? that is, um, like you said, abstract and in some way very metaphorical as well, in visceral. And um, what I think it would be important for us, for you to tell everybody a little bit about your background as an educator and um, how that experience of mother and educator kind of also informs the way that you produce your work. Because I feel as though um, they're ultimately intertwined in the, in the purpose for your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, for me, I, I really need to be in a quiet space where I can break things down and um, like analyze experience. So I have a background in experiential education. And before I taught at the university level, I taught in um, K through 12 public school for 12 years. And in those areas and in any high quality program that is well-funded, um, there's experience and then there's reflection and analysis and connections and um, introspection um, before there's more um, experience and um, interaction. And so I think my process of, of in, in teaching and painting um, is to go out there as an extrovert, experience, interact, um, develop questions, and then have a period of reflection and rest to, um, to solidify the information, to synthesize, to make connections and to make meaning. So, Having said that, I'll move to Nest. Right. So we've seen, um, and you've discussed about your background and the development of these forms. And we looked at visceral and your experience as a, as a mother at an early age. And now we're looking here at Nest, which is a piece made in 2020, right? Mm -hmm. 
So visually, um, if we can recall the pieces we've looked at, we are seeing uh, Jennifer's working mind as an artist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> her life and her experience. And then we're coming here 2020. in this exhibition called Distilled. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about Distilled and how Ness relates to it. Okay. Um, so I had the privilege of um, experiencing a year long sabbatical and it was at a time when our world was experiencing a pandemic, a global pandemic. So we had, um, both of our kids were also in school face-to-face -face the, the whole time. So it was an odd experience to have this, um, like to be longing for solitude in this place when so many people in the world were um, longing for human connection. Um, and I think a lot, of, a lot of parents, especially parents who didn't, who had kids at home with them the whole time, um, you know, they also longed for solitude and they got tired of, of touch. Um, so I, I had time and I had time for the first time in, it felt like 12 years of being in school and then getting a tenure track position and trying to get tenure and having babies. And I, I literally collapsed and it was like, as if all of this, like emotion that I didn't allow myself to express and feel it came up and it was intense and it was hard and it was beautiful. And I, I haven't cried that much in decades, um, but it was a, a solid release. And, and it was a, a, a solitude that I so much needed and was so fortunate to be able to experience. And so this work, it was just, it was quiet. And, uh, and I'm, I created those two forms. So I work a lot in panels and then move them around and search for the composition. Uh, and, and I think that has a lot to do with breaking down, um, breaking down experience, breaking down form in order to better understand it. And I put, I put them together and I just I saw this semicircle, this swollen belly, this breast. And then this, I mean, it kind of suggests a hand holding something warm or, or a nest. And I, I just thought, oh, there we go, nest, it's finished. And there was so much just clarity too and then I was able to experience and, and feel. And it felt like, okay, I did it. Like we've got these, we've got these two humans that we're, we're raising and, and it's, it's all okay. It was like a big exhale. Like the babies are here. We have a home. I'm so grateful. Felt clear. So would you say that distilled kind of in terms of what, why you decided to purest form of it, but do you also think that it was also that time, like you just discussed, that moment where you were able to um, uh, just draw into yourself, like you said, and just go back to that time when you were painting and rediscover that as well as a painter? Oh, definitely. Definitely. And also I think I'm almost 50 and you hit that point and you realize, oh, you know, time is finite. Like, what do I really want if I'm lucky to have another, you know, 25 years? Like, it's not that much time. What, what, what's really important? What do I want to carry forward? And I think that the pandemic influenced the title and also, you know, this place of, of middle age, like what really matters. Mm -hmm. And I think um, I'll, I'll go on to the next slide, but what I'm trying to, what I'm thinking about through your, the way you're speaking about your artwork and how that relates to the next work is like you were saying that, that, that moment of peace, that breath that you were able to take, mm -hmm. find the most important parts, like you said. And when we go on to the next two slides, you can kind of, see Jennifer's work in that period of where it wasn't so comfortable, right? Jennifer mm -hmm. 
So we'll look at that. So this was created before, this is an older work in 2016. And it's a, um, a picture of, that is a pose, a pose of the hidden mother um, genre. So back before we had um, more advanced cameras, people had to actually hold the children still in order to get a quality image. So these people were usually cloaked and their hands were usually hidden and they were usually meant to be invisible. But uh, I thought we would remake the image of a hidden mother and uh, my hands would be visible in order to show the domestic labor that actually goes into the raising of a child. So this is the hidden mother of uh, our first kid. And I, we have the hidden mother of the second kid. Um, and it's funny because, you know, it was a tense day and everyone was, you know, home and it was hot and, you know, we shot it <laughs> and my knees were showing and the, you know, the kid is looking off and yeah. And I, I, I don't like it, but I almost like that. I don't like it and that it's so imperfect because it just captures like what happens if a second one comes along, which yeah. is a big mess. There's, there's even more of a sense of a loss of control. Right. <laughs> which which for me is poignant in our conversation, especially what you were just mentioning about that process of organization that you take in your work. Mm -hmm. You know, deep thought, compartmentalizing, processing, understanding the experiences that you've had and are having. And I think also very important to point out that is that this is a photograph, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, <laughs> and our, the exhibition you have now is not photography. Right. right. It's, it's painting. Right. And, and there was a reason for photography. Right. right. Well, I mean, the reason was I want, I didn't want to work with chemicals when I was breastfeeding or pregnant. And so I worked a little bit with acrylics. Um, and that still seemed kind of scary. Um, yeah, but digital photography is safe and it's also efficient. But I also, a, a coworker of mine, a colleague gave me a book of um, Linda, I think it's Fragler Nally, something like that. This um, artist, Italian artist who made this just collection of all these hidden mothers. And when I was pregnant, or actually maybe after we first had Lur, she gave it to us or to me. And I just thought, oh, this is just so good. And to be able to make one with the hands visible. Cause the, I mean, the idea that you would close, the, the person holding the child was usually the mother. And it's like, oh, let's render her invisible. Like, you know, the child exists because of the labor. So, right. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that feeds into a lot of the analysis that you were doing as a, as a working mother, right? Well, definitely. That plays a lot, a big role in the, in the work that you're creating. Mm -hmm. and, how, and, how, and how important was that at this time? And what were you feeling? Oh, man, I just, I felt this complete and utter um, revelation that my mom was a total rock star. Like I couldn't, I can't believe what she did and my dad too. And my mom worked a job and put dinner on the table and planned the holidays and scheduled the, the doctor's appointments. And I just, you know, I realized that, wow, this is an intense uh, setup that we have and that we still have that's persistent today um, in many, but not all of the, the family structures. You yeah. mean and Pardon? Mother? You mean as women and mothers? Yes. Mm -hmm. With the, the third load, the, the mental load, the third shift, the fourth shift, you know, it's a lot. And I think that um, more men are experiencing that now as well um, because more partners and husbands are, and men, fathers are doing more around the house than they were, you know, 20 years ago. Millennials are doing more than Gen Xers. Gen Xers are doing more than um, baby boomers. But it's still, um, the structures in society aren't set up in a way that supports the families. And that burden is continuing to fall on women's shoulders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I find it very intriguing the, like you said, the covering of the mother, right? 
this all just exists perfectly, but the mother is veiled. Mm -hmm. But who is creating the order? Mm -hmm. Right? Right. <laughs> In many ways, when it comes to family life, traditionally, let's say, we'll use that term. And so I think stemming off of that idea of um, to connect that idea of motherhood, to connect that idea of order and understanding. And using aspects that, that comes into that, right? Um, but the way that you work is very much like that process of education you described to us, right? Mm -hmm. Really organizing, thinking things through and, and processing. And I see this in your and your nurture nature piece of points as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm in this piece, I approached much differently than I approach most of the much of the work, especially the paintings. So this work, and then also hidden mother, because I had a plan and then I executed it. And it was, um, I think maybe I did that during that period because so much of my life was chaotic I just needed a plan and I needed to be able to do it one two three without this kind of open-ended terror <laughs> that I was experiencing in all other areas so um by 2013 or by uh the time I was 43 I was trying to have another child and my eggs were no longer viable and my partner and I were fortunate enough to be able to go through uh, the IVF process and we did, and we now have a four-year-old child as well. Uh, but initially and, and still even um, occasionally, but not as strong, I really struggled with the, um, the fact that I wouldn't share any DNA with this person. And, um, and I was shocked that I, that, that bothered me because it just seemed so vain. And it, like, I felt ashamed that it bothered me like, oh, I wish I could just be carefree and cool and, you know, just be fine with it. But, but I wasn't, and I really gave myself time to grieve and time to honor that, uh, that fact. And so I had all these little glass plates and I had a, I had worked on a, I have, I have a work from a previous year of working on these little glass plates, which I found immensely satisfying, I think, because it was just like confined, the little box, and I got to do it, and then it was done, and then that repetition was soothing, too. So I have each letter of the English alphabet, and then also 23 chromosomes, and um, and I, for me, it just kind of showed like what a, um, what chance there is in, in, in creating a life. And so this piece is actually interactive. So the, the, the gallery, sorry, there are children upstairs. The, um, the gallery viewer can manipulate these small, tiny glass discs around on the pedestal. And every time it's exhibited, the, the, dis, the, not the discs, the um, slides are placed differently on the pedestal. So the viewer gets to interact with it. So different options, different opportunities, mm -hmm. different creations every time somebody interacts with it right which is almost like that kind of releasing that fear that you were talking about i think in terms of your connection gen genetic connection okay yeah with your child you know it's like now you're releasing it and and all these people who interact with this piece have the opportunity to take something that's yours and create something new hmm. you know? So I find interesting, like connection between the, you know, the biological factor and the component of actually using it as a physical structure, a puzzle, mm -hmm. you know, used um, to, you know, make order. Yeah. Figure things out. Yeah. And you release it. You released it. You released it to the public. <laughs> right. Ah. <laughs> You're like, here, it's yours. You yeah. figure it out for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've done the best I can, and I think it's awesome. Thanks. So now we've looked at um, a bit of Jennifer's work because she has um, different works as well. And if you want to know more about Jennifer, you can also go to her website. Um, www.jennifercomb.com, correct? Correct. 
And you can see that this is a screenshot of her website. <laughs> and you'll see different, um, different pieces from that time that also delve into aesthetically different and conceptual and how distilled it is um, this opportunity of returning to painting. Her as well, and a, and at that, quite an adventure, right, Jennifer? <laughs> quite an adventure. <laughs> and I'm starting with story time and connecting it to the last piece because I do really find that kind of that educational part of your of your self coming through, you mm -hmm. know, finding this meaning through chance, as you were explaining to me. Yeah. So. Again, these are two panels that I, I, and I usually start working both of them at the same time. And sometimes I'll start with four and then I'll keep the four or I'll just have two and it'll turn into two different works. But uh, I was, I, I just read, oh, I happen to have it right here. She has a new edition, but Kimberly Brooks has this text, um, Oil Painting, Safe Practices, Materials and Supplies, The Essential Guide. And she um, lays out a, a simple, approach to, to painting without solvents. And this was important to me because of the water supply that I want to protect. And also because my studio is in our basement and I don't want my family, the kids to be breathing um, solvents. But it was a really, it was, it was a hard process to let go of the viscosity that the mediums uh, give us, um, uh, gave me through the painting process. So I felt really, I felt stuck as I was, as I was painting this. Um, so I think that also comes through with the work. It's not, you know, it's definitely hard, hard and contained. Mm -hmm. And so when I work, I, I, I have like a, a sense. So it's a color combination or um, a gesture or some sort of um, composition, even from another uh, artist's work that I admire. And I'll, I'll just start with that and just let the painting lead me and take me. And I was just, you know, I was, for years, I've really loved Calder Circus because it had this like childlike, um, it has a childlike quality to it. And, and then we, I, one of our grad students, Brooke Armstrong, had this work early on, like I think her first semester, and it was just like, oh my God, that's just like the Calder circus work. And it's like a fair, like a, like a, like a, uh, a costume almost. And, and I even, I wrote her and I asked her for the slide because I wanted to see the work. And so all of these different kind of ideas, but they weren't even ideas. They were really more feelings and senses um, were coming. And then I finished and I, and I realized, oh, that just, I can't look at that now and not think of the cat in the hat. And so then I was thinking about, you know, the, the, the uh, important uh, and relevant critique of Dr. Seuss's uh, work in terms of his, um, uh, in terms of the racist and sexist themes that emerge, that emerge and um, are repeated throughout many of the different books. And as a teacher, um, there are so many other, there are so many other wonderful high quality um, pieces of literature that are even early readers for children, but still as teachers, we just fall back on Dr. Seuss because that's what we were raised on and it was so joyful and joyous. But, um, but when you change and when you learn new um, parts of our history and you learn more critical theory, you realize, oh, you know, I can't see this Dr. Um, Seuss's hat the same way I saw it even 30 years ago. Um, so I thought, oh, okay, I, like people are going to see this and see Dr. Seuss's hat. How, I don't see how they can't not. And so I started, you know, thinking too about like what, what that that hat and that stand-in for vaudeville um, that took place when he showed up at this children's um, house on a rainy day. And so then I realized, oh, I've almost suggested this um, new approach and this. Um, an alternative to these readers that we, you know, we have previously used. So this is an example of how a, a, an abstract image um, can read in one's mind as an object because of one's lived experience. Um, so that's my experience with this work as I 
you know, could only see the, doc the Dr. Seuss's hat. Mm -hmm. And tell us how, and, and because of this, you decided to actually title the piece, right? Right, yeah. And sometimes, I mean, I actually thought seriously about, about leaving it untitled, but then I, I'm so committed to um, providing children and teachers with materials that are culturally um, appropriate and um, necessary and critical. So I thought, oh, okay, I can use this work as a, as an, as a, a point of education. Because you found yourself in your own, let's say, historical memory that you didn't even know you were accessing. Right. Right. Come creating these images that you didn't intend to create. Like you didn't, like you were discussing, it's like you're not intending to create these images. These are images that you may not have access to. Correct. You were telling me. Right. And after the fact, you're realizing how much of what we've learned in our in your childhood or we all learn in our childhood is really the basis of a lot of the things that we are today, right? Right. Came out in this work of art. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important part of your work, right, Jennifer? Correct. Is that part where you're 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 speaking towards that unknown element at the same time, you know, it's kind of like this mysterious part of the identity as it comes out in your work. Mm -hmm. But is it necessarily meant to be spoken as such for the viewer? No, I just, I chose, I chose to share my interpretation with this work, but I, I don't, I don't usually, I wouldn't say that's typical. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we can go to the next slide, yes? Mm -hmm. And these um, are four pieces from Distilled as well. Untitled one through four in the exhibition. And here I just put them all side by side so that you all would get a better image of what the works look like. You wanna speak in general to the pieces as a grouping of four and then we can go down to the the two that you want to focus on? Sure. So these I created last. So I, I, I'm excited because I feel like I know where to go next. Um, and these are, these were done in acrylic, which after struggling with trying to not, um, use, uh, solvent or different media mediums, um, with the oil works, this was really liberating because it was so viscous and so um, diluted and I could layer quickly. Um, and so I think it like when, when you realize that you can't be a full-time artist, um, you've got to, you've got to change your practice in order to help that to fit your, your current situation. And, um, and part of that is an external, like the medium, the format, the workspace. And part of it is this internal like release of this idea that, you know, the artist can only work art, this really one dimensional um, definition of, of what it means to be an artist and especially a painter, right? You're alone in your studio, someone else is cooking your meals or you don't eat and that's all you live and breathe for. And I mean, that's not, that's not the reality of, of most working artists, male or female or, yeah. So, yeah, so working through those two and then like the internal and then the, the materials and, and having them all up on the wall and be able to just freely move between them and not have to wait for paint to dry, to be able to create chaos and then with blocks of color, create order um, it was extremely uh, satisfying, soothing, um, and it, yeah, this process of like solving the puzzle, placing the puzzle. Cathartic experience as well. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell them a little bit about your background in painting and how you were taught to paint? I found that interesting when you explained that to me. Okay, so I... I mean, how far back do you want me to go? 
Well, I think the way that you paint, like how you were taught to go use your paint in layers and you were talking about rather than sketching or doing things like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I worked, I think starting, I don't know what year, but I started working with a, um, a loving, wonderful person, um, Simon Kogan, who uh, was trained in um, Russia and then immigrated to the US. I don't, I don't remember when, but he um, like gave us a clear way to do it, gave us these steps and, you know, taught how to, you know, paint from technically from life. And so I think, I mean, that influenced me because I, I mean, I learned how to layer and how to start thin and build as we um, build up with thickness and with fattiness as you move away um, from the, the surface. And then, is that what you wanted me to talk about? Exactly. Okay, yeah. And then I think working from that, even when I was working abstractly, like that process for me has been one of like creating chaos and even creating a mess, like something that isn't, um, doesn't fit and doesn't feel satisfying or right or like it works. And then like creating order out of that. And I think too, out of that, like, you know, abstract, like messy process. And I think like, I liken it to like the process of, of cleaning a kitchen and, and making a meal and, you know, following these steps and having these skills, but then also improvising and, um, you know, dropping flour, spilling flour on the floor and, you know, broccoli and, and then the meal is made and everything gets cleaned up and, you know, the cycle begins again the next day. The work in the gallery space. And we'll end on these two final pieces. So tell me, Jennifer, why did you want to focus on these last pieces? Um, what I, what I really, and the, the part of making these that I, I really enjoyed was that, um, especially in the work on the left, just this confidence that I felt with making the marks and um, applying, you know, the white in order to create order and to create uh, form. And again, I think, you know, like, how are these autobiographical? For me, it's this, this, um, like hint into the, the daily lived experience of the mess and then the cleaning it up. It's this, um, this experience that we go through when, when we're learning, it's uncomfortable and it's messy and it's not tidy until we've made these connections and um, then we're able to clean the slate. So I think also that these, these forms that keep on appearing in my work, these, um, to me, they're egg-like, they're nest-like, they're boat-like, they're, they're womb-like, they're um, a swollen belly, a swollen breast. Um, they're, they're playful and childlike, I think, in color. So they, yeah. To me, that's how, I mean, I, I think you wanted me to talk about how, you know, this, how abstraction is autobiographical and that's how, that's how I would define it. And it also is an interesting point because we were, I was saying, well, you're, these are the two focus points that we're choosing to end on in our discussion. And this is at the time in the development of your exhibition distilled that you started to feel more, um, at ease with your painting, right? As mm -hmm. you were getting, you were moving through that process of getting back into painting. And at this point, when you started creating the Untitled series of work, you were starting to feel more at ease and more comfortable in what you were doing again, right? Mm -hmm. So is this something that we see uh, your work going towards or continuing? Yeah, I mean, I you working this way or how are definitely. you feeling with your work? I, 
yeah, I want to move forward, maybe not working on paper, but, um, but definitely working non-objectively. And, and I think it's important to, for me to not title the work a lot of the time, because I think it's more, I mean, on one hand, it's makes it more challenging for the viewer because there's, you know, we have, as, and me as a viewer, I experience this too. It's like, oh, you know, there's no like cheat sheet. I really have got to figure this out on my own. Like, what does this mean to me? And that's what we want exactly. kids to do in the museum and, 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 you know, even adults. Um, but, you know, we're always like trying to find, you know, the right answer because the right answer isn't, isn't within me. It's out there in the world. But, you know, I think that's one, one way of looking at an untitled work. And another way I think is, um, it's, it's more of an invitation to the viewer. Like I, you don't need to know my story. My story is, is irrelevant really. Like what I want you to do is to find your story in this work. You know, how do you, how do you relate to those shapes? How do you relate to those colors and to the, the transparency? Like, what does that, how does that read to you? So I think when you're saying that to me, I see how that untitling these works allows for that conversation to take place. Right. That's my hope. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think in some way, once again, you're, you, we talked about this as well as how these untitled pieces, when you are finding your flow, mm -hmm. work that you were creating, you somehow, again, once again, are looping back into that ground piece, right? From mm -hmm. 2007, where you were discovering what you were doing with these forms and shapes that were coming to your mind that you were putting together in that work of art, yet they're so comfortable to you, they're so part of who you are and your work that they are appearing once again in your in your work today and mm -hmm. very fluidly in, an, in the entitled pieces where you kind of let loose after working through that process you had with figuring out the paint, right. figuring out what you were doing. <laughs> once you figured it out, it was like, the culmination of that working process that all finally became liberated in these pieces, right? Well, well, sort of. I mean, I think the liberation came with acrylic. I don't think I really <laughs> figured out how to paint in a way that was satisfying to me without um, the without solvent, without the evil, because I want to be able. I want that thinness. I want that veil. Well, so, if you but I'll let you know when I when I figure it out. Yes, and I do want to I do want to tell you, Jennifer, that actually the the works have those that quality that I that you were I think they have that quality that you were looking for. Maybe you because you also have experience paint, painting with oils that you were looking for more of that transparency in those layers. But I do believe that in these works on paper there is a lot of that. Yeah, but this is acrylic. I know that. Oh, but I, but I want to have it in the oil. I know you I'm do. Saying. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> but I see it in your acrylic work. I see it in these, in these acrylic works on paper, really, especially in person, when you see them in the gallery. You see that quality of layer and color and understanding and composition and thought process that is going on in your work. I mean, it's outstanding, honestly. We've had... Um, it's it's really for those of you who are here in Great Falls or in Montana to come and see Jennifer's exhibition. Um, you will understand um, on a deeper connected level, I think, just by observation, um, how beautiful the works are and um, connect to them um, on, a, on a different level, you know, that may or may not relate to Jennifer's autobiographical process in her work, but they are, um, they have some sort of archetypal form within them uh, that resonates with origin. And so um, they're, they're quite successful pieces. And we're very pleased to have this exhibition in our museum 
and grateful to have Jennifer Cohen's time to discuss with all of you, our patrons and our friends and our members um, to learn more about Jennifer and her work. Is there anything more you would like to say to our audience, Jennifer? I'd just like to say thank you. And I wish I could have seen your faces, but thank you so much for taking time out of your busy lives to spend time with us. I appreciate it. Yes, we thank you so much. And once again, I'll just scroll up. So you can see, come to the square, you Jennifer's exhibition. And thank you so much, Jennifer, for your time and your effort and your knowledge. It's very valuable and we are thankful to you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful night. And come back again soon. We are open. Thank you so much. I'm trying to get this. There we go. Bye, everyone.